It's my pleasure to be with you this morning. We're going to pick back up in our series through Matthew this morning. We uh, haven't been there in a little while. We had our State of the Church and then Sanctity of Human Life last Sunday, but we're going to pick back up in the book of Matthew beginning in chapter 4 this morning. But before we do, I'd like for us to pray together one more time. Father, what a privilege to hear from you this morning. And so we say, as the boy Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak to us, O God, let us hear your voice. Say exactly, Lord Jesus, what you want to say to each and every one of us. And, O God, may it... Transform us, Lord, into the divine image to live lives of bold, courageous, loving obedience to you, till your kingdom come. And we pray that it will soon. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 4. Um, now, as I said, we hadn't been there in a while, and I just wanted to catch us up briefly. Uh, we've seen so far Jesus' miraculous birth. And in his birth, that Jesus is the son of David, that is, that he's the promised king to rule over God's people forever. He is also the son of God, the virgin-born God-man, the word became flesh, who has dwelt among us. And so he is, in the most profound sense, Emmanuel, God with us. And we saw how that That even as a child, the nations came to him as represented by the wise men, uh, while at the same time his very life was threatened by King Herod. And so while the Gentiles were seeking him as king, most of the Jews seemed indifferent to him. And they fled to Egypt only to return, thus depicting Jesus as the true Israel, the true Son of God, entering the land of promise to take over it, to possess it, if you will, by destroying God's enemies so that he might receive it as his inheritance. And we saw how John raised up God the Baptist to prepare, prepare the way of the Lord, how the very last words of the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 4 foretold of one who would come as Elijah, who would prepare the way of the Lord, The coming of the Lord whose coming would be both for salvation and for judgment. Judgment against those who reject the true king, but salvation for those who trust and hope in him. And then we saw how the king was revealed to us at his baptism, the entire trinity present. At the inauguration of Jesus' formal ministry, the spirit of God descending upon him, anointing him as God's chosen king. And the Father himself declaring to all that this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So the king is come. His ministry is starting. (laughs) What will he do? What's the first thing that he'll do? Well, what I want to talk about this morning is that the first thing Jesus does in his ministry is he stomps the serpent. And that's why I've titled the sermon, Stomping the Serpent. We see this from Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came... And said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And... On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. The word of God. You may be seated. I'm going to see three truths from our passage this morning. Number one, the true Son of God depends on him alone. The true Son of God depends on him alone. Number two, the true Son of God submits to his will alone. The true Son of God submits to his will alone. And number three, the true Son of God worships. I mean, the true Son of God Uh, Yeah, the true Son of God worships him alone. The true Son of God worships him alone. So first, number one, the true Son of God depends on him alone. Uh, As I said, I've entitled this sermon Stomping the Serpent because, as we've said before, one of the ways to to view the entirety of Jesus' life and ministry is that he is undoing what sin and Satan did in the very beginning. He is the fulfillment of the very first promise made in the Bible. Found in Genesis 3.15, that, uh, which says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He's, he's talking to the devil here. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so the very first promise in the Bible is a descendant of woman who would stomp the serpent on his head, but he would be struck in his heel at the same time. And so we see that this is what Christ has came to do. And at the very outset of Jesus' ministry, we see that Jesus' opposition, that the, the opposition that Jesus will face is not, is not just including people. And in, in one sense, it's not ultimately uh, uh, including people. But that the, the great enemy that he is battling is the devil himself, which is why there's so much demonic activity present in the ministry of Jesus. And that's why he casts out so many demons. And the first thing that we want to note about this is, who is it that led Jesus, because this is fascinating, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? Who did it? The Spirit. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In the Old Testament, heroes of old, like Samson, for example, it would say things like, the Spirit rushed upon him. And he went and he would destroy and obliterate God's enemies. The David wouldn't touch Saul because he was God's, the Lord's anointed one. The, 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 in the Old Testament, a pattern is that God's chosen uh, people of his specific choosing for a specific purpose would be anointed by him. In his baptism, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit to do what? To do battle against God's great enemy, which is Satan. And so we have to reflect here further about what's going on to see why God would ordain things in this way. Because it's fascinating that Jesus is led out by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and that for 40 days and 40 nights. And then the first temptation, as recorded by Matthew, is the temptation to do what? To command stones to become bread. So the question we have to ask is, does any of this sound familiar to you? I would say that God is continuing to tell us the same thing that we've talked about uh, in some of our previous sermons. That is that Jesus is the true Israel. That he is the prophet greater than Moses that Moses himself prophesied about. That at the outset, uh, and, and how is this so? Because what happened to Israel? At the outset of Israel's existence as a nation... Through the exodus and through the deliver, the, them being delivered from slavery in Egypt at the outset of their existence at the nation, the beginning, if you will, of them serving God, what did they do? They wandered in the wilderness. For how long? Forty years. What's Jesus doing? He's in the wilderness for what? Forty days and forty nights. Doing what? Doing what Israel should have done. Because, remember, Israel, what was the number one thing that Israel kept complaining about? Bread. Bread. And what did God do? They grumbled and complained, and so what did God do? He fed them from heaven. 
they woke up in the morning and there was bread on the ground. It's amazing. But it was called manna and they were to collect it. And what was interesting about the manna is that they, they were only to collect enough for one day at a time. In fact, the Bible says that if they collected more, then it would spoil. They were only allowed to collect enough for one day at a time. Why, why is that? I think it's quite clear that God was teaching Israel something. What was he teaching them? That, 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 they must de- that God's people, hear this, God's true people, this is what they do. They completely and wholly and utterly depend on God every second of every day. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be God's people. Because reality is, is whether we acknowledge it or not, we depend upon God every day. Every moment of every day. That's why, that's why I was praying in my prayer, just reflecting upon this. Every time your heart beats, it's a gift from God. There are, there are people who went to bed last night thinking they would wake up this morning. And it didn't happen. Every day is a gift from God. We depend utterly upon him. We can't go one day, one second without his hand upholding us or we would perish. And he was teaching them. He was teaching the Israelites, right? He was teaching them. You can't, you have to learn to depend on me every moment of every day. That's why they could only collect enough for one day because that means every night, every single Jew had to go to bed thinking, God has to provide for me tomorrow. Or else I won't live. I won't make it. That's how God's people live in complete and utter awareness of their dependence upon Him, trusting Him for every single thing, and that acknowledging that apart from His sustaining and provision, we would not make it another second. But what Israel did over and over is they grumbled about bread. You ever grumble about anything? But what did Jesus do in the wilderness? Rather than grumbling about bread, he denied himself bread. And didn't grumble one second about it. He denied himself earthly food so that he might do what? Do what he told the devil he was doing. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. That proceeds from the mouth of God. What sustained Jesus those 40 days? God and his word. That's what Jesus did. And so when the devil tempted him to use his divine power in a way inconsistent with the purpose for which he came, he looked the devil in the eye and told him, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is a lesson for us. This is a lesson for us from Jesus. And it's a lesson that we have to learn from the Israelites too. God's word was that he would sustain them, that he would take care of them. And all they did was complain about it. But Jesus literally survived on nothing but God's word for 40 days, trusting completely, wholly, wholly and utterly in God's sustaining power of his physical nature. Feasting, though he was hungry in body, he was feasting every moment in God's word, which was surging through him and sustaining him. It was his source of life. It was his source of sustenance. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is this, what sustains you? And what sustains me? Jesus, it said, was hungry. But he was only hungry for food. He was full of God. And I think one thing that we can learn from Jesus here is what what good is it if we're full on this world but we're starved for God? We know better than the Israelites. What is our sustenance? What sustains us? Are we clinging to God and his word? Is it to us Better, sweeter, more satisfying than anything else this word has to offer. Jesus said in John 4, 34, he said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me 
and to accomplish his work. And so we see that Jesus' sustenance was God's word. It was God's will. It was God's purpose for him. And he perfectly depended in the wilderness, doing what? Doing what Israel should have done. Doing what you and I should have done, but didn't. Completely, wholly dependent on God. And Jesus is teaching us that we too must trust God likewise. Trust God for our tomorrow. And this is, this is harder, I would say, than it's ever been to do in this age. Especially, well, at least here in America, when we're just so filthy, filthy rich and, and blessed beyond anything we could imagine. If we just crack open a history book or go fly overseas, we would acknowledge that. There was a reason why Jesus said it's harder than a camel. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. Why? Because the more stuff you have, the more likely you are to trust in your stuff than to trust God. More, the more likely I am to believe, well, I'll be fine tomorrow because of the government or because of my retirement account or because of my insurance policy, not because of God. What are we trusting in? Where is our hope set? What if everything we set our hope in this very day burst into flames and was gone tomorrow? Would we still have hope? That nothing can take away. Would we still trust our Savior? Who is more satisfying than anything this world has to offer? And the glory of this is that Jesus trusted for us in the wilderness for every time we didn't. So that if we turn from our mistrust, Back to God. He will forgive us of our sins and count Jesus' trust as our trust and bring us into his kingdom. And fill us with his spirit such that as we walk in his spirit and lean on his spirit, we too, like Jesus, can get desperate for God and deny ourselves and follow him. And that's, and that's, and that's, a, that's one of the things clearly also about the, the, the wilderness fasting too, right? That Jesus starts his ministry is that it's a time of what? It's of searching and seeking God for what? The next, the next three years of his life. He began with a dedicated time of getting desperate for God, denying himself food and, and things of, of basic sustenance, saying to God, I need you more than anything, God. I need you to fill me with your spirit and to teach me and to lead me and to guide me. And I'm going to seek your face so that I can endure the next three years so that I can save the world. Jesus, desperate for God. What if, what if we got desperate for God? What if we believed that we needed him so badly that we wouldn't dare begin the next single season of our life of ministry or our next single season of our life at all without getting on our faces before God and saying, God, unless you show up in this next season of my life, nothing's going to happen. Unless you show up in my life, God, unless you show up in in my one's life, they're not going to get saved. Unless you show up in my family's life, this situation isn't going to get better. Unless you show up and fill me with courage and conviction to stand up and and speak for you, then I'm not going to do it. What if we got desperate for God and recognized that we have no power, but he has all power? Then if we cast ourselves upon him and get desperate for him, he'll work and he'll act. See, that's when God delights to show up. That's when he delights to show up. When we finally realize how much we need him. So why not? Why not? Why not take a page from Jesus' book? You got something that really matters to you in this life. If you got nothing else, you got this right here. There's someone you know that if they died today, Why not get on your knees and say, God, I'm not going to eat today. And I'm going to plead that you would act in their life. Maybe if we got desperate for God and finally acknowledged how desperately we need him, he might show up.
The true Son of God depends on Him alone, number one. Number two, the true Son of God submits to His will alone. The true Son of God submits to His will alone. We see this in verses 5 through 7. It says, The devil took Him to the holy city and set Him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to Him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on your hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This temptation is fascinating because the devil quotes scripture. If you've ever wondered if the scripture could be abused, here's your answer. Side note, when someone uses scripture to you to argue for something that you've never heard before, how will you know that they're telling the truth? There's only one way. You have to know it better than those who would misuse it. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The devil quotes scripture to Jesus. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. He can use scripture to lie. But he can't deceive Jesus. The temptation is for Jesus to test God by more or less demanding a miracle. Satan quotes Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12, which is a psalm about God's faithfulness. And that is that as we trust and rely on him and run to God as our refuge in our time of need, in our fortress, in life's difficulties, then he will deliver us and he will protect us and he will save us. And that's the basic thrust of the psalm. The devil runs afoul, however, by breaking a cardinal rule of interpretation, namely by isolating a passage of Scripture and treating it as if that is all the Bible has to say about a certain issue. It's called taking a verse out of context. It's very common. You can make the Bible almost say anything that you want to if you take a verse out of context. You know, there was a Christian calendar one time that, that said... Um, I will, give you, I will give you all these if you will bow down and worship me. It was supposed to encourage believers. They quoted Satan from the passage that we just read. It was on a Christian calendar. Somebody needs to read their Bibles before they make Christian calendars. Don't quote dev, the devil in your Christian calendar. You have to read. You can't take things out of context. And when you're trying to understand what the Bible says about a particular issue... You don't just read one passage, but you read every passage that the Bible, that, in the Bible that speaks to that topic, and then you fit them all together. And so you can come to a robust, full-orbed understanding about what the Bible teaches about that specific issue. But when you take one isolated passage and try to build a whole doctrine on top of it, that's when you get heresy and lies and deceit. It is certainly true, for example, that God loves and saves and delivers his people. But that's not all that the Bible says about that issue. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, in the last letter that he wrote to Timothy before he died for his testimony of Jesus Christ, he wrote this to Timothy. He said, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, the Apostle Paul had complete and utter confidence that God would rescue him. And God did rescue him. Not from death, through death. God rescued the Apostle Paul through death when he was beheaded for his witness of Jesus Christ to the Gentile lost world. And before the before the thud of the axe could be heard. He was standing among the glorified in heaven. In the presence of his Savior. 
the Lord will rescue from every evil deed. You see, we have to read the whole Bible to understand what it says about a particular issue. God does rescue. God does save. But the Bible also says that his salvation always is not always in the here and now. But see, if, if we understand the Bible rightly, that's not a problem for us because the Bible also says that the here and now is not all that there is. Right? In fact, the here and now is just the tiniest, just a small, tiny little part of our lives. And so the fact that God will rescue us, not just in the here and now, but ultimately on that day when the Bible says the sky and the mountains will flee. And all that has been done on the earth will be exposed. And those who hoped and trusted in God will be vindicated. And those who live for themselves shall receive what is due. And then our salvation will be fully and finally complete. Why? Because God will rescue from every evil deed. Sooner or later. Contrary to this, the devil tempts Christ to put God to the test. It is one thing to trust in God in whatever comes our way, in whatever evil befalls us. That's one thing. But it's another thing to presume upon God to do something that's otherwise foolish as an attempt to force God to do something that he hasn't promised he'd do in every circumstance. In other words, testing God is a, it's, it's trying to force God into your will rather than submitting yourself to God's will. That's what Jesus said in John 6, 38. Again, he says, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so that's one of the ways that we test God. Rather than saying, God, I want, what's your will for my life? That's what I want to do. We basically do what we want to do and say, God, bless it. Bless my plans for my life, God. What is that? That's putting God to the test. That's saying, I'm going to do what I'm going to do regardless, and I just hope God, I hope God blesses me, makes it work out. Rather than doing what Jesus did and said, I didn't come for me. I came to do what he sent me to do. So the question that this temptation forces us to ask is whose will is supreme in your life? Do we just do what we do and hope it fits into God's plan? Do we set about our own plans and and hope that God will just work it out? Or do we, like Jesus, seek the will of the Father with our life? Say, it doesn't matter what I want to do. What does God want me to do? What is one way to know whose will is ultimate in your life? Well, let's just ask this diagnostic question. When's the last time that you did something that you didn't really want to do, but you knew it was what God wanted you to do? If you can't remember, it may mean that you're just always doing what you want to do. Because if if we say that we worship God, God, but God never corrects, but that God that we say we worship never tells us to do things that sometimes we don't like, that God that we worship never corrects us, that God that we worship never contradicts our own opinion, then it may not be God that we're actually worshiping. It may be ourselves. Let me tell you something. If God always agrees with you, you don't know God. And if God is not in a position in his life, in your life, where you're following him and not saying and not telling God you have to follow me, then you know whose will is supreme in your life. But consider this. Jesus Christ only lived to be in his mid-30s. He never did a single thing outside of the will of his father. And no greater life has ever been lived. You think you got great plans for yourself? Get over yourself. You live for God. He'll do more with you than you could ever imagine. But you have to surrender. Surrender. 
You have to surrender. You have to trust. You have to believe that he's better, wiser, smarter, truer than you. That's what faith is. So the glory of grace is this then, that Jesus, unlike us, perfectly submitted to the will of the Father for every time that we did it. So that if we turn and bow the knees of our hearts to him and submit our will to him, he'll forgive us. And count his submission as ours and bring us into his kingdom. So the true son of God depends on him alone. The true son of God submits to his will alone. And finally, the true son of God worships him alone. The true son of God worships him alone. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. The final temptation here in Matthew is significant. It does have kind of a climactic feel to it. Jesus has not succumbed to the other two temptations. He would not grumble against God like his ancestors did. He would trust God and find his sustenance supremely in God and his word. And he also refused to test God, to try to force God to fit into his plans. But rather, he was completely surrendered to God's plans for him. And so unable to get Jesus to waver from his complete dependence and devotion to God... Satan pulls out all the stops. What does Satan promise Jesus? The world. He promises him the world. But there was one little problem with his offer. And that is that God had already made Jesus the king of the world. Remember the the Magi, they came... To Jesus, they came looking for Jesus and they said, where is he? Where is he who has been born? The king of the Jews. But then we have to read a little bit more than that, right? Because who were the Magi? The Magi weren't Jews. But what did they say? They said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Because we have come to worship him. So what does that mean? It means Jesus isn't just the king of the Jews. He's the king of the world. That all will come and worship him. So what then is, is Satan really offering to Jesus? Well, I think it's this. The way that Jesus would fully and finally secure his kingdom, fulfill the will of the Father, fulfill all that the Old Testament had spoken had to happen, and to forgive his people of their sins so that they could be then brought into his pure and holy kingdom and live with him forever in a world free from sin. You see, the way that that had to happen, there was only one way. The cross. The cross. What's Satan offering Jesus? He's offering Jesus this, the crown without the cross. That's tempting. That's tempting. The crown without the cross. But what would that mean if Jesus took that offer? It would mean Jesus would be king and we'd be dead in our sins and going straight to hell. And Jesus said, no. He said, no. He will get the crown the right way, God's way. And he'll go through the cross to do it, even if There'd be hell to pay. And by the way, that's what Jesus bore on the cross. Was God's wrath due our sin. And he said, I choose the cross. The way of the cross is the way of suffering. It's the way of self-sacrifice for the eternal good of others. It was making himself least so that the Father would raise him up as the greatest. It was Jesus' unique way, totally contrary to the way of the world in terms of what it means to be king. Jesus reigns by serving. Jesus reigns 
by giving of himself for the good of his citizens. Jesus reigns by obedience to the Father. That we might be saved. He's the king. He reigns whether anyone whether everyone acknowledges it or not. But the glory is that he's a merciful king. And if you will come and if you have not bowed the knee of your heart to King Jesus this morning, the good news of the gospel is this, that Jesus didn't choose the crown without the cross. He chose the cross so that people who turn from their sins and believe in him and trust in him and bow the knee to his kingship, he will grant full and unfettered access to his kingdom. If you will believe and trust and follow him. Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. His burden is easy and his yoke is light. And you can find rest for your soul. So one final thing I want to mention as we close this morning. And that is that there's even more, I think, going on when we see Jesus in the wilderness. Remember, there was another man who was tempted by the devil. Adam. Adam, Jesus wasn't just doing what Israel should have done. Jesus was also doing what Adam should have done. Adam fell in Eden. Jesus conquered in a desert. Jesus did what? He took his heel and he dug it into Satan's head. For you and for me. And so as we close this morning, the offer is open. The gate to the kingdom of Christ stands open if you will enter by trusting in him, believing in him, following him, and you too can be saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning.